Hello, you're listening to Streaming Audio, and today we're talking to CTO and Apache Kafka tool builder, Ralph Debusman, who's running the technical side of a company called Forecasty, who are building out an artificial intelligence platform for predicting commodity prices. You know, what's the price of copper going to be three months hence? Not an easy task. And not an easy task for him. You know, I remembered as we were talking, you know, when you're the CTO of a startup, you end up doing a little bit of everything, absolutely all the different nooks and crannies you can get into. And so that's kind of the way this podcast went. We ended up talking about a little bit of everything. How do you migrate from batch machine learning on a group of flat files to a more real-time streaming approach that's going to work better when you're dealing with the real-time nature of financial markets. More importantly, perhaps, how do you make that kind of migration as painless as possible for all the data scientists you need on your team? How do you bring them along gently? What tools do you build? What parts of the developer experience are missing? And if they're large ones, how do you fill that gap? Not easy questions, I think you'll agree, but Ralph has some really thoughtful answers. Before we get into it, streaming audio is brought to you by our free education site, Confluent Developer. More about that at the end, but for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is streaming audio. Let's get into it. My guest today is Ralph Debusman. Ralph, welcome to the show. Thank you. You're the CTO of Forecasty.ai, and I like that URL because I kind of can begin to guess what it is you do, Forecasty AI, but maybe you should give us the summary. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, what we do, I mean, um, is actually building a, a forecasting platform for um, focused now on commodities. So we are actually building it for predicting commodity prices into the future. So you can actually... Um, yeah, decide on what to do with uh, your commodities. For example, if you're a manufacturer uh, and you procure commodities or if you're a trader or you do hedging, you can actually um, see how the price would develop uh, over the next few, few months or few days. You can change the frequency and then decide um, what to do to buy, to sell, to short, these kinds of things. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. So it's, it's a product called Commodity Desk, uh, and we are focusing completely on this one now, even though there's two others on the, on the web page which are <laughs> now kind of frozen. Yeah, so and that's what we do. And we are, actually, I mean, just to, um, um, to use the time here, <laughs> we need, um, we are fundraising at the moment. And um, so if you're if you any, any kind of VC, uh, we haven't yet contacted, <laughs> which is improbable, but maybe, uh, or some angel investor. You're going in with the shameless pitch early. Okay, fair it's enough. Very, 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 very shameless. But I have. Yeah, we, we otherwise, all have to pay the bills. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's it. And, and at Forecasty, basically what we have done now, uh, since I started there at the beginning of this year, is to, um, to make it more real-timey. So it was actually, um, the, the platform was, I mean, very batch-driven. And still is in, in large parts, but we uh, have started to do um, to kind of uh, change it um, that it becomes more uh, Kafka based, so to say. <laughs> yeah, because and, this um, is why I wanted to get you onto the show, because the idea of doing artificial intelligence modeling in real time is mm -hmm. really interesting. So take us it into is. what kinds of AI techniques are you using to try and f forecast commodity prices? So let's start there. So, I mean, we, we have a bunch of models already. We have um, basically first built a product called Business Desk, which was a no-code platform actually for forecasting as a whole. So you could forecast anything, not just commodity prices. You could do okay. all kinds of forecasts. Um, and for that platform, we've developed um, a large set of models which... Uh, we can select uh, from and to basically see what model matches or works best for the given commodity at hand. Um, and, but they are, I mean, these these models they are they are still edge driven. So basically, they have to see the entire data set um, at once, and then they run and they do their hyperparameter optimization, feature selection, all these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and that takes also a lot of time. Um, I mean, especially um, if you scale the platform 
Um, and you do, for example, we have like 60 commodities on, on the platform now. We will have more than 200 very soon. So the um, when you want to do daily updates for all these commodities, daily predictions um, for them, and you rerun your models every day, um, it just gets very expensive computationally. So you have to pay a lot of money to Azure, <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> whatever yeah. you use. Because it's yeah, just a lot of compute which you need. It's also not very environmentally friendly, actually. <laughs> yes. So this is because the naive implementation is you get a massive data set, you run a training model on the whole thing as a big yep. batch process overnight or over a few days, and you get a model out that will try and predict new prices, right? And you do that for 60, 200 commodities. Yep. But then that's the great thing about the financial markets. There's always new data being added all the time. And so you've mm -hmm. got to rerun it. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And if you, if you adopt this batch mode, I mean, it's very hard to, to incrementally um, do the training. And uh, that's what we are kind of, kind of pushing now. I mean, we're, we're trying to find more models uh, which you can train incrementally. Um, and where it actually makes sense of this, uh, for example, a bunch of reinforcement learning uh, models, which um, basically lend themselves to being incrementally trained. Um, we also added, I mean, that's also related to this uh, oven behind me, I guess. Um, so um, because <laughs> because some of our forecasts, uh, um, so let's go back. So when the Russian uh, invasion started in the Ukraine, um, a lot of our forecasts um, kind of were wrong, right? When, because for example, one example yeah. is nickel. So nickel, which is what you need for, um, for example, for building uh, batteries. So Elon Musk is a good customer of that. Um, right, yeah. So the, the nickel price went up significantly uh, when, the, when the crisis started uh, at the end of February, beginning of March. Um, and we just couldn't capture this, um, this spike, uh, uh, by our models because uh, the models are not trained. They did. They hadn't seen any kind of crisis like that in the last twenty years or something. Yeah. So yeah, I, I we, would be almost yeah. scared by artificial intelligence that could have predicted that coming. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and because we wanted to kind of be able to capture this in a in a better way, at least shortly before the crisis arrives, we actually um, set out to also build um, on the side build. Um, real-time uh, sentiment analysis module, which uh, takes in data from from Twitter, from uh, from LinkedIn, um, oh. also from from various news sources, um, also Reddit, I think. Yeah, uh, where we uh, we kind of combine this data, um, filter it, sort it, and um, use it for essentially improving the models. So we show kind of a fear index. For the customer as well, where, where the customer could see how much fear we have in this market surrounding the commodity in question, and oh, crikey, doing these things, and that was actually the the, the starting point for really bringing in um, uh, Kafka and streaming into this startup. And it was that's I mean we can talk about this uh, later because the interesting journey is also um, to kind of um, take your data scientists by the hand and bring them bring them on because uh, they are actually not used to that and they so most of them have heard about Kafka for example and stream processing but they haven't really done it and they might be scared and yeah and yeah it's a different world a, from I'm assuming mostly relational databases and large flat CSVs yeah not even yeah. relational databases too much really just files <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <In> a local <laughs> file system more or less um, CSV files for example and then which you convert into these Python data frames most most often, and then you do your magic on the yeah. tables essentially. So that's what they are doing. So they they have big problems sometimes to um, grapple with the cloud as such. I mean, we have a cloud native pl platform, everything on Kubernetes, everything cloud native, uh, open source stuff. So I'm kind of teaching the data scientists to um, embrace that approach is one thing, but the next step is actually to bring them to the streaming to the streaming world. <laughs> so that's what, yeah, so, what, that's what I so did. How do you do that? I mean, what's the what's the model you're moving towards from flat files into a Kafka stream processing world? 
Yeah, so there's multiple aspects. I mean, one aspect which I tried to, to cling to from the beginning was to, to really make it easy for them. So to kind of hide a lot of the complexity which you have with uh, Kafka. I mean, we chose Kafka because it's kind of the industry standard because I worked at that for the next, uh, last seven years or so. So we didn't look at others like, you know, Pulsar or Azure Event Hubs or anything. We wanted to have Kafka. and um, But Kafka as such still has these, uh, I mean, you know, all, the, all these nitty gritty things like, uh, um, you have to understand uh, compacted topics. You have to understand. So if you want to go into Kafka streams, it gets even more messy. Um, and you can't possibly uh, start with that uh, when you teach people to adopt Kafka. So yeah, I made it I wouldn't start as simple that as possible. Team. I wouldn't start that team on Kafka streams. Yeah. Also, yeah. I mean, even even the, even the simple. Uh, thing of, uh, of partitions. I mean, if, even that is kind of a low-level thing which I try to hide. So I basically told them, first of all, just use single partition topics. Don't worry about partitions. Don't worry about uh, uh, the retention. Just set it to unlimited. Um, make it very easy for them, actually. Um, don't think about compacted topics. Don't think about keys, just about values. So, so kind of really trying to simplify it um, as much as possible for them. Um, and then what we also did is we, um, at least at the beginning, we didn't want to pick up stream processing. Well, not the stateful one, at least. Okay. So, um, so that was the idea to kind of use um, a real-time database, which is more powerful than um, than the druids of this world. Uh, so, I mean, another shameless plug, but I'm not actually, yeah, but we use Rockset. So, so Rockset is actually, um, uh, a bit more powerful than um, it is at the moment than Druid and and um, and Pino, so you can do some joins and stuff which you can't and, and, and those softwares. So we chose that because it the idea was to um, to kind of avoid doing too much stateful or actually avoid stateful stream processing um, completely. To just have Kafka topics, simple uh, simple consumer producer microservices. And then just push it uh, all into or pull it all into this uh, Rockset database without presumably with an off-the-shelf connector. Oh, it actually uh, Rockset allows you. It's even simpler. So it has this um, built-in native connector. So you can just oh, okay. tell it tell it the topic to uh, connect to, and then it continuously streams in the data. So it's it's very simple. And there was the idea to make Kafka as simple as possible to avoid stream processing at the moment. Um, and uh, go for the most powerful real-time database we could uh, get our hands on in terms of okay. uh, functionality, or SQL and functionality. So in that sense, you're kind of using Kafka as the next step up from large flat files with more yep. options for the future. Exactly. I mean, we know at some point we would have to also uh, venture into stateful stream processing with whatever software we can get. I mean, that, that there's a huge market now which has sprung up. I mean, there's don't, not just KSQL DB, there's also um, Delta Stream, there is uh, Imar Rock, there is so all these Flink-based uh, technologies now springing up. Mm. Let's see what, what comes, but um, we wanted to kind of keep it away from the data scientists at the beginning. But um, yeah. So, so you just you're just teaching them like here's how to make a Python consumer and a Python producer, and just well, starting there. Okay, yeah. how's that been going? Uh, pretty well. So um, I mean the the, the pure Python uh, consumer producer stuff was I mean very easy for them, so they did understand it. I I told them this uh, caveat about the consumer groups, so that you if you want to consume <laughs> again, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and you you wonder why it's not showing you the, the first elements again, because the, the consumer group has already set the offset to a higher value. But yeah, it, it worked pretty well. But what we found out next was, um, uh, I mean, I could have known that from the, from the beginning because I had similar problems at Bosch where I was kind of the Bosch Kafka evangelist <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for the entirety of the company. Um, so, and because what, what was missing was kind of a, of a nice, um, user interface to Kafka. And that's still missing in a way. So, that, so I'm coming to this cache uh, with K point. Because um, yeah, you've got this tool, K-A-S-H. 
for yeah. a Kafka shell thing. To, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's why I, I built that one. So because um, currently, I mean, you have some 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 nice Kafka UIs now. So there's uh, Cowl, which has now been acquired by Rependa, I think. You have uh, what is it called? I mean, of course, you have the Confluent uh, UIs, which are pretty good. Uh, you have um, Conductor, yeah, this one as, as well. So there's a bunch of uh, new UIs uh, around. Also an open source UI called Kafka UI, I think, simple name. <laughs> but um, what's actually missing is still for me, uh, is kind of a nice shell. Uh, so, I mean, you have all these Kaf Apache Kafka commands, which you can get with the Apache Kafka or Confluent distributions, yeah. you know, Kafka topics or <laughs> Kafka. Yeah, that whole batch consumer. of shell scripts. Yeah. All these shell scripts built. And around. there's a KCAT, which used to be Kafka cat. And there's KCAT, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Exactly, which is, I think, by the same guy who did uh, the C library, like, uh, yes, right? I believe so. Yeah. Eden Hill, and also the Python bindings. So um, that's also pretty nice, but uh, KCAT is kind of, really kind of more of a cat version, so it, it, it can show you, it can also use for producing, but it's, I, I like it, but it's not complete. And what I wanted um, is to build kind of a shell based on a RPL, so based on, uh, based oh, yeah. on a programming languages interpreter in a way. And I did okay. that already with um, a program called Streampunk, which was, I showed that at uh, Kafka Summit in London, actually, um, in a small session, uh, just before the party, so maybe <laughs> I might have missed um, <laughs> Always the toughest and, slot in a conference. That yeah, just it wasn't the, party, the best slot, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, but the party was nice. Anyway, but um, <laughs> well, the thing is that um, this was kind of a Two ambitious things. So the, what I did there with Streampunk was uh, I built um, uh, a shell on on GraalVM. GraalVM is kind of a polyglot uh, JVM from Oracle, basically, okay. which uh, allows you to to run uh, Python, JavaScript, a uh, bunch of languages, Ruby, inside of the JVM, um, and also R actually. So. Nice language for <laughs> forecasting. And um, the idea of that tool was to kind of build um, a polyglot shell. So you could, uh, it was kind of a thin wrapper around the Kafka, uh, Java Kafka client library. Um, and you could use it from all kinds of languages, from Python, from R. Uh, so you could use different RPLs, different uh, interpreters on top of that, and then use that as your shell, whatever right. programming language you, you like most. like. JavaScript, Python, or whatever. But it was too ambitious. I mean, they didn't have the time actually to really build this out. So the next step was now being in, the, in a data science environment to come up with a with the same thing actually, a thin wrapper around um, a basic Kafka library. And I just wrote a wrapper around the um, Python library for Kafka. It's it's called okay. Confluent mm -hmm. underscore Kafka. So that's the yeah. Uh, I've used that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you know that. Um, and what I found is, I mean, it's it's of course very nice, but um, um, the Confluent underscore Kafka library is um, in some ways overcomplicated. Uh, I, I found, I mean, you, could, you can't easily use it as a shell. I mean, you, you can use it, um, uh, you can perfectly use it in your in your code. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but if you want to use it in a shell where you just want to have like very simple uh, steps, so you want to, uh, create a topic, list the topics, uh, have a look at the size of the topic, see the watermarks, like the lowest offsets, uh, highest offsets, all these kinds of things. You maybe want to upload a file where one line of text is one message, and these kinds of easy things. Um, and for this, you would have to write some wrapper code. And I did that basically with CachePy. So CachePy is actually using the power of Confluent underscore Kafka of this Python library but makes it a bit more accessible so that you can actually use it uh, as a shell. So it's very easy. Commands are just, I mean, you just create a, a cluster object basically, um, and then you can list the topics, uh, the groups, uh, ACLs, and, and do all kinds of things there just with a very minimalistic uh, uh, parameter set. So you don't have to worry about any objects. Uh, it's, it's just extremely minimalistic. So that it's easy to use. Right. So this is, uh, in a way, it's really a user experience project, 
rather than rather than programming a library that gives you more power it's about making that power more accessible yeah that's it actually so it's it kind of tries to make it make in this sense really uh, really kafka more accessible in the, in a way because um you can then use that thin wrapper um on top of the confluent kafka thing to uh, to build scripts uh which are then much nicer looking because you don't have to worry about um, creating objects and all kinds of things. Uh, and and Confluent Kafka on this library is also requires you to dive deep into the resulting uh, objects which you can get. Uh, and it's, it's just, just a little bit more streamlined. Um, and that allows you to write scripts much quicker than before. This paints a picture of a very friendly CTO if you're writing these uh, UX projects. For the data scientists. Yeah, I mean, in a startup, you can. <laughs> yeah. Do can do this. I mean, you couldn't do this if it would be a large organization. I mean, it's it's. Yeah. It's a small. One of the joys yeah. of being a programmer at a startup is you get to do a bit of everything, right? Yeah. And you get exactly. to just jump on what the real problem is. Yeah, that's it. I mean, because I I wouldn't like to kind of just be a CTO in the sense of the in the normal sense, right? I mean, where you are completely detached from the actual coding um so. yeah you're just making management decisions about coding exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I but i think it, you can't you can't really i mean lead a team uh if you i mean especially this in, in the start of i found this you can't really lead the teams when they when you can't connect to what they're actually doing so um i was actually having a, a great time with um these guys kind of understanding. So when I came in at the beginning of this year, so they, they kind of saw, oh, we have a sparring partner. So we have someone who whom we can talk to who understands what we are doing. And, um, and they kind of really got great ideas. And they did, I mean, they excelled actually. And I was really happy to see that, how they would excel after giving someone to talk to in a, in a way, because there was, yeah. Yeah, and if you can give people in that position the right tools, they can do so much more. Yeah, and if you can also, people... I mean, you have, you have to kind of, uh, oh, but sorry, maybe. No, I was just wondering how many people were talking about. How many data scientists, how many like pure technical people in your team? Yeah, so it's, it's actually six, uh, six technical people basically um, outsourced in India. Um, okay. Great, and another shame is plug later, last one. Uh, um, <laughs> From so two are from Infosys and four are from CFAS, which is a consultancy. Really great. So they actually, what they did is um, to um, really begin thinking on their own and having great ideas how to improve our infrastructure, um, like yeah, extremely well. So they 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 they, they started uh, thinking about GitOps, uh, like really advanced kind of things. Uh, oh, cool. And how many data scientists are we talking on the AI side? It's five, so it's uh, okay. Also, not too many. That, that's what I mean. So it's it's a pretty small team. That yeah. that feels like a, <laughs> my kids are in school, and I'm thinking about class sizes, right? How many teachers <laughs> per student? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit like they they that's each have one idea, and a right? fifth dedicated programmers. Right? This is this yeah. is a very nice ratio for them. Yeah, it's it's pretty nice. Because usually you get these bigger <laughs> <laughs> yeah. teams. Yeah, yeah. So, so what kind of stuff has that enabled them to do? Um, so, I mean, one, one thing, I mean, one uh, particular thing I built this uh, CachePy tool for also was um, to deal with historical data. Because, I mean, it's one thing to have consumer producer things where you, uh, and we're just looking at the current data flow but yeah. if you want to also incorporate historical data, so in our case, for example, we had um, all the Twitter news about nickel, for example, f uh, from the last seven years or something. And you want to upload them in one file or in, in one go to Kafka, basically, as the yeah. historical data. Then, um, I mean, we first uh, started to kind of uh, run a script on our local machine, a producer basically going through this, this large text file of like a 150 megabytes or whatever, and um, sending each message from a local machine into the cloud Kafka cluster. We had, I think we used Confluent Cloud at the time or so. And um, it, it took ages. And, and whenever your um, laptop was kind of uh, 
used for something else, it took longer, or maybe you would have to switch it off or something. Yeah, it, it was just not really, it was cumbersome to write, to, to, run, to run it from your local machine. For a 150 megabyte file? Yeah, it took a I long mean, time. 150 somehow. gigabytes? No, it was just megabytes. It was, oh, it was, right. yeah, well, it was going wrong there? pretty long, pretty slow. Maybe the, we also have a bad connection. I don't know. But it took some time. So the, the idea was to kind of um, have this shell in the cloud. So that was the original idea. So we built CachePy to be uh, used in the cloud or cache. I mean, CachePy is, I think, the name now because cache is already taken yeah. as a name from, yeah. from a Kotlin shell. Okay, so oh, some okay. kind of Kotlin <laughs> shell I've seen that in GitHub. Naming but things cache, remains cache hard, right? Yeah, cache dot <laughs> pi. And yeah, so so the idea was to kind of um, uh, yeah take a shortcut, uh, bring the entire file of historical data to the Kubernetes cluster, um, then log in there into the pod uh, of, on the Kubernetes cluster and push it from there, so that you would have this. Uh, Shorter distance, basically between. Uh, I, I mean, basically, you would have the file already in the cloud, and it was would be easier to send it over to Kafka. So, and we wrote this uh, simple upload function in CachePy, which allows you to simply take a text file. So basically, the command is uh, upload <laughs> <laughs> file name, topic name, and then off you go. So that's uh, that's the kind of thing that. Sounds easy, but if you're not comfortable with the programming of it, just having a one line as to do it, yeah, it's like back to developer experience. What so I think that's this tool. I mean, it, it, yeah, I was talking over you again. Sorry, but the thing is, um, um, I think this tool is actually useful for also. I mean, also outside of forecasting. So this is, uh, I, yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it's on GitHub also. I mean, how I, I can put in put another shameless plug. So um, it's on GitHub. I'm going to have to watch you. I'm going to have to start charging pie. you. Yeah, you, you, have to, you, you have to kind of uh, cut them out afterwards. But um, the okay, but it's a, it's it's already beginning to be very useful. So it includes also ACLs. The only thing I need to add now is also to to add support for um, for schemas like Avro and Porsche buff. Because oh, okay. that's all. Yeah. There was also some omission I intentionally need did at the beginning to kind of not think about um, schemas at the beginning, so to just use JSON payloads. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is also dangerous uh, on one hand. On the other hand, because, uh, I mean, if you don't do it right, then you can easily corrupt your topics, right? If you send one message with a bad payload, then... Yeah, you just make life harder of... for all the readers going forward. Right, so that's yeah. one of the first things I would like to mo to bring in bring back in soon because <laughs> without schemas it's uh yeah yeah i can see how i mean Streampunk sounds like it was a bit too abstracted out you can bring your own programming language exactly maybe cash maybe you know, there's always a balance to strike between flexibility and being specific for the job right now yeah yeah right yeah it was too good to abstract and also too much work to do because you would have to actually build not just this wrap around um the Java library, the Kafka Java client library, but you also would have to build um, wrappers and write documentation um, for all these bindings, basically for the different programming languages. Which yeah, uh, is, yeah, and then too much. That's that's the kind of approach that takes a heck of a lot of work because if you've got five programming languages and four of them are excellently supported and excellent documentation, yeah, then you'll still get complaints about the fifth one all the time. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. So yeah. this is why I kind of froze that at, for the moment. So yeah. um, the stream punk thing. It, no, it was cool. I mean, in the Kafka sign presentation, I basically uh, used Python and R. So I used uh, both languages uh, <laughs> in one, <laughs> so to say. Because you can in one script. Use, yeah, because you can use GraalVM kind of uh, for mixing, mix and matching these uh, languages. So whenever you have one language for which you have a library which is not available for the other language, you can use that. <laughs> Which is oh God, that's neat. a bit mad. That's, it's 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 nifty. That's oh, it sounds really cool, and it also sounds a little bit Frankenstein. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stitching it together does. different parts. Yeah. How does that work? Out of interest, is that is that working because there are J JVM flavored Rubies and Pythons out there, yep. or is it somehow so the, actually running the real Python and the real Ruby? 
No, it's it's JVM flavored. So I think it started out with JavaScript actually. So this is called uh, Reno or something. So I think this was where it was started. Um, but it, it's all basically re-implementations of these languages in, in, in on the JVM essentially. Okay. Um, which also means, I mean, it's not also perfect because uh, the Python part, for example, is not complete. So you can't. I think you can You still can't use uh, PIP. So this uh, installation script okay. for installing libraries, you will have to build them uh, using other commands and only a subset of the existing libraries is really supported. So More of a dialect than the same language. Yeah, it's a bit yeah, more complete yeah. for R, I think, but it's also, I found it pretty slow. So yeah, so it's, it's not complete, but it's, it's a cool idea. And I thought, I mean, building a, uh, a Kafka shell around this would be Cool, but it was kind of too much. <laughs> too, <laughs> yeah. too Frankenstein to to really get a lot of interest out of this. Yeah, yeah. Too many options are sometimes a deadly thing. Yeah. yeah. So going back to the world of forecasting and Kafka, you, mm -hmm. so you've got at the moment it is um, a kind of smart pipe to feed your analytics engine in Rockset. Yep. But what's the future plan for that? Um, well, we're actually doing a lot of other things now based on Kafka, thanks to this kind of head start, which we had. Um, we're also building a notification engine now, which is of, also, of course, based um, on microservices, talking together with Kafka. So basically, you get alerts about um, when is a price drop, for example, when, when the price of that, that commodity goes down pretty much, then you get a notification on your phone or by email. And this is all based on Kafka now. We also want to kind of attack the um, the main uh, forecasting in a way that we also use uh, Kafka there. So that's uh, that's currently not being done. So um, at the moment, there's still the batch engine running, and and we are trying to um, make it more um, amenable to um, to incremental updates, which you can also do without using streaming, and then adding. Uh, Kafka on top. Right, a, two, a kind of two-phase yes. approach to move it over. Yeah, because yeah. you have to always be incremental uh, if, you, if you come from some existing piece of architecture. Because that's the trick with, um, I know, to my knowledge, most AI models are built around the idea that we batch train it once. Do you yeah. end up using different algorithms to do the incremental stuff, or is it just refining the process? Partly. Yeah, partly. I mean, some of these. I mean, it, it, this is all. This is all time series AI, basically, right? So, and and for most of them, you can uh, modify the algorithms in a way that you can um, just add new data and you keep the model which you've developed up to the, this point in time intact. So, you can also drop the hyperparameter optimization and feature, feature selection um, and just use that what you have done before. So you can kind of reuse your time series models up to a certain point and add more data. So that's that's possible for some of the existing ones which we have. You just have to do it in a way. Um, but as I said, there's also, I mean, uh, a bunch of modern models called, I don't know about other models called, or based on reinforcement learning, which um, there's also a Python library for that called River. Uh, and with that, you can also use more incremental. Uh, you can also use it for more incremental uh, time series machine learning. So that's uh, it's different ways, so different models, and uh, kind of re-implementing the same models which you already have. Yeah, that's kind of it. And it, because we actually also want to go into day trading, we need uh, to kind of go to. The, the incremental approach and to, because day trading means you have to be really fast. I mean, like, yeah, super fast. Latency can be like a few seconds. So that, that's the next step and will be based on Kafka and these yeah. technologies. I can see for your kind of business model, day traders being eager adopters of this, but you've got to react in minutes because fortunes yeah. are made and lost in minutes on that. In exactly. That day, right? And we're not yeah, yet, yeah. So, so because the, it started out from being a procurement solution, actually, which uh, ah, the latency for, wouldn't requirements. Yeah, for people who are looking three months ahead on the price of copper, that kind of thing. Exactly. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so we all seem to be back again at the journey from a long batch process to up to the minute real time processing. Yeah. Well, good luck Let's with the future, it. Ralph. It sounds like a fun journey. <laughs> it is. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, it, it's really a lot of fun to kind of uh, instill new ideas in, in people and then see how they excel. So they, um, so kudos to my team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A good note to end on. Ralph, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Also for allowing me for the, for pulling off these shameless plugs. <laughs> yes, yes. We were billing you later for those. So you'll get in trouble yeah, yeah. in the end. No worries. <laughs> we'll be the biggest company in the world anyway. At some point. <laughs> you have to get one more in. I'm going to stop before you do another one. Thanks, Ralph. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. You know, I will be fining him for putting so many shameless plugs in. That was a bit much. But on the other hand, I have some sympathy, you know. When you're the CTO of a startup, you're kind of the midwife of a newborn technical baby. And being a midwife is sometimes messy. We know that. Much cleaner will be your experience of learning Kafka if you head to Confluent Developer our free education site that has a wealth of courses covering everything from writing your first Python consumer to stateful stream processing with Kafka Streams. Check it out at developer.confluent.io. And if you have the knowledge already but you need the cluster, then take a look at our cloud service at confluent.cloud. You can sign up and have a Kafka cluster running reliably in minutes. And if you add the code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get some extra free credit to run with. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Ralph Debusman for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. Mm-hmm.